Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. Our guest today is the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. Thank you very much for being with us, Mrs. Prime Minister. Thank you very much for having me. Queen Elizabeth II uh, passed away a few days ago after a 70-year uh, reign. She was the head of state of your country until November 2021, when Barbados uh, became a republic. Uh, your reaction to her death and maybe her decades-long reign? Well, I think, as I've said before, that Queen Elizabeth II um, did extraordinarily well as the head of state of the United Kingdom and indeed as head of the Commonwealth. Um, when you consider that when she became queen that we were still looking at Morse code and when she has died, regrettably now, that we are in a position where you can be broadcasting from a studio with me right here at Sciences Po and I'm not even seeing you. So that in and of itself tells you what her span um, entailed in terms of technology. But it also entailed presiding over, um, as head of state, the dismantling of the British Empire and the creation of the Commonwealth. It also entailed her continuing to be that constant anchor for the British people um, while not getting involved in the business of the politics of the nation. And indeed, it is significant that the last Prime Minister that she swore in, Prime Minister Truss, two days ago, I'm told, was born exactly 100 years after the first Prime Minister that she swore in, Winston Churchill. Right. Uh, obviously, uh, her son, uh, Charles, came to uh, your country uh, when you celebrated uh, right. uh, this new republic ushered in a few months ago. Uh, he was still a prince at the time. Now he's the new king. Uh, what kind of king do you expect him That's to right. be? I expect him to do extremely well as the head of state of the United Kingdom and as head of the Commonwealth. Um, I've gone on record and making the point that um, King Charles III has been a man ahead of his time. Um, when you look at the work that he's done over the last 50 years in particular with respect to urban renewal, architecture, the environment, preservation of biodiversity, and in particular working with young people at risk, um, you see a man that has literally engaged for most of his life all of the topics that are particularly relevant to the world in which we live today, especially on the issue, as I said, of the environment right. and young people. Uh, uh, do you expect other uh, countries uh, to follow the path that Barbado chose, becoming a uh, republic, especially in the Caribbean? We're hearing the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda saying a referendum would be held within three years. Jama Jamaica is also uh, talking about this. I mean, uh, could this usher in, maybe accelerate uh, a trend uh, in the Caribbean, especially, and maybe beyond that? Well, let's be real, there are countries that became republic before us. Um, whether a country becomes a republic or not is an intensely um, peculiar decision to their national um, condition. And as not for me to comment, suffice it to say that we felt that it was critical for us because we want the opportunity for every Barbadian boy and girl to grow up and to aspire to be president. Um, in your case here in France, you've had how many republics? So that um, perhaps I'm having this discussion in the right country. Right, because, I mean, this is, after all, uh, a legacy of colonialism, let's put it this way, to have uh, the king of the United Kingdom still uh, nominally the head of a state of other countries. And I guess that's one of the reasons why Barbados decided to become a republic. It is. Um, it's not the only legacy of colonialism, and it's certainly not the only legacy of colonialism that remains across the world. But yes, it is. I mean, one can argue that if you look at the structure of the United Nations with respect to the establishment of a permanent five in the UN Security Council, that that in and of itself is a, co a consequence of colonialism. Um, because the imperial powers are who have been given that right to be permanent members of the Security Council. Would that be the same if we were literally forming the body today with 193 countries instead of the handful of countries that formed it in 1945? Right. Uh, during his visit to your country, uh, then Prince Charles addressed another uh, colonial uh, legacy. He condemned, quote-unquote, the appalling atrocity of slavery that, quote-unquote again, forever stains our history. Uh, you've talked about uh, his values, his advocacy. Do you expect him to do more on this issue, uh, given also that 
the British royal family has been linked to the slave trade in the Caribbean, maybe a formal apology or even reparations. Well, I think that if you go back to his statement at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, he certainly acknowledged that this is a conversation whose time has come. But let us also be very clear, it is not the king or the queen who makes these decisions in the United Kingdom. It is a matter for the government of the United Kingdom. And therefore, that is the entity with whom we should have the conversation and will have the conversations, as well as for the corporate um, entities, as well as the church. Um, those are the entities who benefited as well. To the extent that the royal family is involved, they're represented by the government as opposed to themselves individually. Right. Uh, I, I want to turn to another issue uh, that's dear uh, to uh, the heart of uh, the new, new king, uh, the environment. Uh, obviously, uh, you have the United Nations I, General... I thought you were going to ask me about whether reparations was as legitimate a question also for the people of Europe, because, of course, there were also other European colonies that colonized, and therefore I think that the issue for reparations goes beyond just simply King Charles III and the United Kingdom and really is an issue that we ought to be discussing with all of the imperial powers. Point taken. Uh, I, I want to get to the issue of uh, uh, climate change. Uh, this is uh, not yeah. just a theoretical issue. It's an existential issue, literally, uh, uh -huh. for uh, your uh, country. The United Nations General Assembly is around the corner. COP27 is not uh, far away. Uh, are you more concerned than you've ever been? Well, we continue to be concerned, of course. I mean, look, look at what you experienced here in Europe this week. I mean, this month and last month. And, and look at what happened as well in the United States of America with the floods and Pakistan with the floods. Um, you know, when we were kids, we third world from Jamaica had a song called 96 Degrees in the Shade. And we viewed that as the hottest, hottest, only to find out this summer that really and truly countries would experience 43 degrees um, and 110 degrees, 109 degrees Fahrenheit. And that tells the story. Um, we continue to face a very, very critical situation. What has happened in Pakistan is, is heart-wrenching. And every week for the next few months, we continue in the Caribbean to live on the basis of will a hurricane come across the waters or not. At the same time, we're also suffering from droughts because there are groundwater crises across the world. And quite frankly, the world has to act with greater dispatch. The problem is, is that it's not a simple issue. And even with that, we recognize that you're still going to have to use some fossil fuels clean, clean, for clean energy, a clean bridge, probably natural gas. But what is happening here in Europe with the gas prices has made that even more complex and more difficult. And then when we look at the fact that small states like ours who want to do the right thing, I announced a tax holiday for all um, electric vehicles for two years, but we can't get the electric vehicles to buy. I announced that each Barbadian homeowner should have the right to be able to have photovoltaic panels or micro and nano wind turbines on their houses. We can't get the lithium to do the bathroom storage easily. So that we have a real issue between not only doing the right thing, but getting access to the supplies and the materials that allow us to do the right thing. And that is one of the things that the world has to manage perhaps with greater degree of efficacy, especially since we have kicked the can so far down the road that we haven't given ourselves enough time to deal with these issues as efficiently as we might otherwise do. Right. I mean, there are many uh, ways to reach that goal, but uh, one evident way to do this is to get the money. I mean, uh, pledges have been made uh, already uh, 12 years ago, again in Glasgow, for uh, the rich countries mm -hmm. uh, to help mm -hmm. finance uh, uh, the fight against climate change. Uh, but uh, then there was COVID, now there's the war in, in Ukraine. I mean, are you concerned that they're not going to fulfill their promises? Now, as you correctly said, promises were made some time ago that would respect to adaptation, but we've never even met the 100 billion that was promised almost a decade or so ago. In addition to that, we have not come up and settled on an agreement that is acceptable to all parties on the issue of loss and damage. Now, you can't have countries who fuel the Industrial Revolution, um, who, who literally 
whose industrial revolution has literally brought the, the stock of greenhouse gases to where it is today, more than even the flow that exists from countries like China and India. The problem has been the stock that's been created from the industrial revolution for the last few centuries. Now, if G20 countries control and contribute to 80% of those gases and that are affecting the warming of the earth, then you cannot ably expect that they should just walk away without taking responsibility for the consequences of them. Now, you said it was an existential crisis for us. It's not an existential crisis for us. It's an existential crisis for the whole world. And you saw that here. It wasn't Barbados that had 108 degrees this summer. It wasn't Barbados that had the life-threatening floods this summer. It was Barbados that had continued to have drought. But these are the things that we have to get in people's heads that don't only look at small island developing states. We might be the canaries in the mine. We're the first on the front line. We didn't cause it. Yes, we're the first. But believe you me, we're not going to be the last. And the rate at which the world is going is going to put millions of people at risk, both in terms of their lives, their property, and their culture. And that is what is heart-wrenching. And we believe that the world needs that kind of political will to be able to have the seamless decision-making. When I say that the world needs global moral strategic leadership, it is because, yes, it's governments, but it's not only governments, because we need to be able to influence how people think wherever they are, and to get us to do the right thing. Now, that does not mean, as I said, no fossil fuels. And the danger of the world in which we live is that people feel that you can reduce everything to 60-second song bite and a four-inch column space in an article. You can't. There are some issues that are exceedingly complex. And because we don't have the sufficient access to resources to supply at the scale at which we must supply within the time frame that we need to supply, there's going to have to be a balance with how we manage appropriately and effectively those aspects of clean energy in order to be able to sustain the quality of life and not to condemn others who have not made it out of poverty to remain in poverty because you're depriving their countries of being able to produce the, the, the natural gas that the world will need going forward. Mia Matle, Prime Minister of Barbados, I want to thank you very much uh, for your time and for appearing here on the France thank 24 you. interview. Stay tuned here on France 24 for more news.